Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you're coming from. Thank you so much for joining this session. Uh, my name is George Murake, and I work with IntelliCup and specifically the SunCup team. SunCup is a convener uh, of stakeholders in the entrepreneurship and impact space. We try to bring together different stakeholders, bilateral, like bilaterals, um, multilaterals, uh, DFIs, uh, foundations, corporates, investors, entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs organizations uh, for the purpose of bringing together entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs and advancing the entrepreneurship agenda. I would like to kindly ask you to please put in the chat box where you're coming from. Uh, maybe also put in your organization name so we can we can see you know who's with us today. Uh, and I'd just like to welcome you again. I would like to hand it over to Ambassador Gurjit Singh to kick us off. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, George. And I thank Sankalp for organizing this session, this time focusing on agriculture between East and West Africa. But we are going to look beyond East and West Africa, eastwards and westwards, and see how agriculture can provide us with a backbone. On this session today, I'm very happy to have with me Maureen and Jerry from IntelliCAP's agricultural team and Desmond Coney, CEO of Complete Farmer in Ghana. So we have one speaker in Nairobi and another one in Ghana. So this is truly the spirit of East meets West in Africa today. I welcome all the participants and I see quite a diversity of them today. And I hope that we would have an interesting session which will raise many questions, but also some possible solutions. Africa today is faced with a new food crisis, thanks to the Ukraine crisis. Now, this is a strange part of the world. You don't do anything wrong and yet a crisis is upon you. First, in recent times, Africa was hit by COVID. Then Africa is hit by climate change. And then Africa is hit by the Ukraine crisis and the resultant blockage of food supplies. Now, this makes us think how important food security is. And this is, of course, related to agriculture. Africa has the CAADP, a Common African Agricultural Development Program, which basically looks at agriculture-led development to reduce poverty and hunger. And Agenda 2063, which is Africa's own manifesto for itself, seeks a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. So, if you can successfully deal with agriculture, you would be able to deal with many of the challenges that Africa faces today. Certainly, food security would be enhanced, so you could have dealt with the Ukraine crisis better had Africa grown more grain for itself. Secondly, Africa could have increased its share in world trade had it also been in a position to export grain, since it already exports a large amount of commodities and cash crops. These are mostly exported to preferential markets based on preferential trade access. So in effect, Africa is not growing what it needs, but what it needs to export. This could be modulated. Another crisis which could have been assisted by better implementation of agriculture policies is climate change and desertification because uh, agricultural products bind the soil and bring climate change to a slight halt. And this could certainly help. Agricultural production in Africa could also contribute more to regional trade. For instance, if you grow more food, you can feed each other rather than each one having to import grain from Ukraine, Russia, United States, or wherever. 
And same goes with dairy. I mean, you can have your own milk rather than import it. Uh, and uh, with the development of the Africa continental FDA, there is more opportunity to develop regional markets. Now, these regional markets are very important because they will allow cross-border flows of people to trade and products to go across under a common tariff scheme. And under the Africa continental FTA, I see the development of regional markets as the most significant development, which will help. The development of the Africa payment system, which under the continental FTA, the Africa Exim Bank is now putting into play, will mean that currency exchange rates will not be so difficult to manage and you need not denominate your intra-African trade in terms of the euro or the dollar, but you could do it through your own currency swaps through this payment system. How can partners help like India? After all, my book, The Harambe Factor, after whom this session is named, essentially is portraying a partnership between India and Africa, which is equal, which is not there to make inroads into Africa, but to help Africa stand on its own, use its own market, develop its own resources and its human capacities to develop with the assistance of possibly Indian investment, Indian institutions, scholarships, fellowship, and also the uh, soft loans. Now, what has India done so far to support African agriculture? There is a unilateral duty-free tariff preference scheme for African LDCs, least developed countries, under which 34 African countries have duty-free, quota-free access to the Indian market for about 97% of India's harmonized codes. This means that you can attract more investment to develop those products which are marketable in India. Secondly, India has a scheme for agriculture related fellowships to train people at PhD and beyond levels in agricultural sciences and research. And that has been very successful. And people come back and join your own scientific institutions and then develop new varieties or adapt technologies which make agriculture more successful. Institution building. India has been ready to support agriculture related institutions in Africa. There is one coming up in Malawi, which is the India Africa Rural Development Institute, which is looking at how to look at uh, agriculture, food processing, and the like. And there are similar in other countries which have been offered, including farm science centers, food technology processing clusters, and the like. India has also offered soft loans. And out of the $12 billion of Indian soft loans operating in 41 African countries, you'd be surprised that most of them actually are for agriculture, either for you know providing agriculture-related irrigation, agricultural equipment, developing agricultural farms, developing you know, textile clusters or sugar factories. So this entire chain from farm to production has been supported by Indian concessional credits. When I did a survey for my book, I found African respondents found Indian investment to be the best part of Indian development cooperation. And among the sectors that they chose, one was agriculture, the second was capacity building, and the third was the role of venture capital. Now, I think all these three can play a big role. And out of India's investment of $70 billion in Africa, a significant chunk is actually in private sector agriculture, like floriculture, horticulture, sugar, but it can go much deeper provided we have the right African partners. I believe that Africa needs improved marketing, value addition, and to become part of value chains, 
particularly in their own regional markets. For instance, uh, Maureen is in Kenya, you know, the East African community, which is now growing with the addition of the Democratic Republic of Congo, actually is covering area from Mombasa to Matadi, from the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. So that is a very big region. And cross agriculture trade through that can be huge. Similarly, Desmond is in Ghana, and Ghana is part of ECOWAS. ECOWAS is an equally big region, and you could have a lot of cross-border trade on agriculture, including value chains to process. I was telling him just now that Ghana produces cocoa, but Ghana could actually process that cocoa and send it abroad, much like, let us say, Benin, which exports a lot of cashew nut to India and runs a trade surplus with India, could actually gain more by learning how to process it. So that, I think, are important areas. Now, in improving marketing, e-commerce, better value chains, and the like, the role of agricultural technology, e-commerce, you putting technology to better use for marketing and product improvement, all these are very important. And I would be very happy to hear from both the panelists today about how technology can be used, because I know that IntelliCap, from where Maureen comes, does a lot of work on enhanced technology usage in Africa. I'm going to stop there now and invite Mr. Desmond, the CEO, to, from Ghana, to now speak about his experiences and possibly speak about some other questions that we have raised. I look forward to hearing you, sir, for the next 10 minutes. And you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be here uh, to speak on some of these issues. Uh, my name is Desmond Connie. I'm the CEO of Complete Pharma. Um, and basically, Complete Pharma, um, it's a marketplace um, that connects farmers, helps farmers to grow, and connects these farmers to uh, markets um, as well. Um, we work primarily in Ghana and in, in Togo. Um, we currently have um, about 30,000 farmers on our platform that we work with. Um, and we basically been able to export and um, commodities and also um, sell on the local markets. Um, the, main, the main challenge that we, we are trying to solve is to digitize the agricultural value chain in, in Africa. Um, and the approach that we've used is to look at um, the, the three stakeholders in the value chain that are very active in the value chain. And these are basically the buyers. Um, so we mostly sell to um, factories, FMCGs, people looking for high volume agricultural commodities. Now the challenge for these people is um, in, in, in Africa, we grow most of the commodities that um, these industries need to run. However, when it comes to like building their supply chain into Africa, because the African agricultural market is very fragmented, you have smallholder farmers um, farming small capacities in isolation. For these um, big buyers, it's a big challenge for them to be able to build um, their supply chain into each of each individual farmer's farm. And that's basically one of the problems complete for my stock lead. And then with the farmers, what we um, what we are do work doing is to is three things. We are finding ways to be able to um, increase their yields, and then we are finding ways to be able to increase their engagement, which basically means get them to producing more acreage um, as well. Um, and I'll talk about how we do this. Um, and then the third thing that we are um, doing with farmers is to also make sure that we have more people joining um, or becoming farmers. Um, so basically on our platform, anyone could come, lease land, hire a farm manager, buy their inputs and start actual production for um, um, a real buyer. Um, so we are trying to lower the, the barrier of entry into farming and make farming more attractive for, for the newer generation as well. Um, I'm happy to um, talk more about these issues and answer some of these questions. Thank you. Now, 
what you have said is extremely important and you spoke about working already with togo your neighbor so i'm going to come back to that but before we do that let me now go to maureen and maureen can actually speak to us from two angles one having been a entrepreneur and the second now working with intellicap agricultural vertical maureen please go ahead and hold our attention for 10 minutes thank you very much ambassador um so i'm um, i've been very privileged to work in east africa and across uh countries to be able to experience uh different agricultural systems and also food value chains uh, at intellicap as an ecosystem builder we are focused on creating knowledge and uh, also networks as well as providing capital and uh, facilitating provision of capital to agricultural farmers and uh, farmers in the in, in in east africa and africa in general uh, considering that smallholder farmers in africa hold about 75% of the agricultural production it is very important to be able to focus on these smallholder farmers especially in market linkages as well as uh, other providing investments for them as well to be able to facilitate uh, them to have good yields as well as sell this and um, also avoid losses for them. Smallholder farmers also provide 75% of employment and knowing that Africa is faced with a huge uh, problem of unemployment, this is a good area to also be investing in so that we can be able to create more uh, employment for uh, people in Africa. Uh, especially on the cross-border trade, we find that uh, East Africa, especially in uh, Tanzania and Uganda, Tanzania, Uganda, and Ethiopia, are the biggest uh, exporters uh, to the other East African countries like Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi, Somalia, and South Sudan as well. And they are able to export to these countries maize, especially, and dry beans, as well as rice and sugar. And this has uh, of course been affected in current situations as uh, ambassador had mentioned uh, due to high inflations that are caused by different factors at this particular moment especially covid as well as uh, the war that we are experiencing and so this is of course causing a big problem and uh, a, a big challenge and affordability of products and foods in east africa has become very uh, unattainable and that's uh, within Telecap as well. We have a currently we have a project that we are working with uh, called the Good Food Innovation Fund, where we are trying to increase affordability and accessibility of food in uh, African countries, in about seven African countries, uh, focusing currently on Rwanda, Burundi, and Kenya. And then, of course, uh, in the next phases, we are going to introduce Malawi, Ethiopia, uh, Tanzania, and Uganda. Uganda is, of course, a food basket for East Africa. And this uh, is able to, I think with the, with the big uh, arable land that they have, about 33% of their land in Uganda is arable. And so they're able to grow crops in this country. And uh, this has, of course, provided a lot of food for East African community. So it is, uh, it is with this that uh, some challenges are faced, especially with the import and export culture in East Africa. Uh, whereby poor infrastructure, of course, plays a big part, as well as the lack of technology. And so investing in agri-technology is, is going to be really important in the next phase of uh, just agriculture and seeing these food products uh, being able to be used across East Africa. So we also have a project that we, we are trying to learn from our other successful models, especially in Korea, where we have been doing a disruptive agri-tech agri study uh, to just be able to identify what are some of the technologies that can be used to be able to improve agriculture in, in Africa. And we do see that controlled environment agriculture is one of the areas that we can be able to focus on. So this uh, being uh, indoor farming, as well as maybe hydroponics and uh, aquaponics and uh, aquaculture and things like that. And we are seeing enterprises in, in these uh, African countries, especially in East Africa, focusing on these things. We are seeing uh, marketplaces being opened up like Twigger Foods, as well as other small players uh, who are also trying to create those linkages between markets so that uh, especially because one of the big problems that we have in East Africa is post-harvest losses, where we do not have uh, 
enough enough uh, enough storage especially uh, or enough technology to be able to save uh, food and to be able to use this food for longer periods of time especially when we're experiencing drought and, and this is a major problem in East Africa as well uh, due to the especially even with the climate change currently uh, we are facing a lot of challenges with being able to sustain uh, value chains food value chains across uh, without being seasonal because uh, being that our background is smallholder farmers and them not being able to access technology that is able to save this food, then uh, we, we do get to lose a lot of food that could be uh, really useful for, for future uh, use throughout the year. So uh, we are seeing marketplaces as well as good, as well as uh, cold uh, and post-harvest sources technology like cold, uh, cold chains. But uh, I think especially in Kenya, we, we are experiencing an eruption of enterprises and entrepreneurs who are focusing on cold chain and market linkages as well as uh, just being able to provide this food in the, in the freshest state uh, to, to the population. So last, uh, last mile distribution is also something that is a challenge, especially being, being that uh, a lot of countries in East Africa have poor infrastructure, especially in transport uh, and irrigation facilities. So being able to invest in this and being able to explore these challenges will be important for the next phase of uh, agriculture in East Africa. Uh, I'm gonna leave it there uh, for now, and then we can take a few questions uh, thereafter. Thank you, Maureen. A uh, very important thing you have touched upon. The two which I want to mention first is the generation of employment through agriculture. So as I said, agriculture can solve many problems. It can solve the problem of employment generation as well if there is enough investment in agriculture and perhaps a move beyond small landholders into larger uh, cooperative land holdings which could then lead to more remunerative agriculture, better produce and bring more people to work in agriculture. In the post COVID world, I think such employment in agriculture and agriculture related processing and management could be a big boost for Africa. After all, Africa has a very youthful population and it needs to find jobs for all the young people who are in Africa. The second thing you have mentioned is about the connectivity and the logistics for trade. I think in many African countries like Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, Ghana, for instance, some of the cash crops and commodities, which are traditionally exported, let's say to Europe or the United States, they have their uh, logistics in place. But for intra-African trade, particularly regional trade, the logistics are not in place both at the policy level and the physical. So I would like to understand, let us say, let's start with Desmond. How do you see, since you already trade with Togo, to trade with a larger area around you, what kind of policy changes or physical changes in logistics would you require? Um, so thank you very much for the question. So I think one of the some of the challenges we've had is uh, has been uh, mostly around payments and and distribution. So I'll I'll tell you one story we had uh, quite recently where we had um, a buyer from Tanzania looking for um, um, pineapples, and we had to um, fly the pineapple from Ghana all the way to Dubai. And these are pineapples, they are perishable. So you want them to get to the buyer quickly so that the, the buyer is able to have a longer shelf life for, for the produce. Um, we had the pineapple sitting in Dubai airport for almost 24 hours. And then it became a problem to ship it back into, into Tanzania because that flight later delayed again. So this is the situation where just trying to trade within Africa is so difficult. And when it comes to agricultural commodities where they are perishable, you want to um, 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 have a longer shelf life, then this becomes a very um, a disincentive 
to even want to trade among each other because the distribution isn't built. Many of, many, many of the time, anytime you want to trade to other parts of Africa, apart from West Africa, this is also the situation. You have to always leave Africa and fly back. Now that's also like a disincentive when it comes to cost. Because um, the flight, adding the cost of the logistics and the distribution to the cost of the pineapples makes it very expensive in Tanzania. So a consumer of someone in Tanzania may want pineapples, but may not be able to afford to buy ones from a neighboring African countries. Um, um, so this, these are some of the nuances. And then with that particular trade as well, uh, when it came to payments, um, it was so difficult. Um, with payment. And so some of the work that the AFTC, um, the, the free trade agreement is, is doing with, with payment is, is very laudable because for this particular example, the buyer had a lot of difficulty trying to pay us because there was currency um, um, that needs FX that needed to be dealt with um, and dollar was expensive for him. So he couldn't buy dollars to pay. It was it was it was it was quite difficult to navigate that situation. So I, I would say the biggest challenge we have with being able to um, trade with each other is having that distribution network and the payment systems to be able to allow anyone, any small uh, or medium scale business to be able to send goods and and services across the continent. I think that that's going to be very very necessary to. To, to, to agriculture as well. Thank you. So regarding the payment issue, the nascent Africa payment plan, which the Africa EXIB is doing, I think that is a step in the right direction. Now Definitely. we have to wait and see how it works. Right? But that could take care of the issue that you mentioned. Uh, exactly. And I'm sure when you use it, you will share with us your experience. Definitely. About um, really happy about the development um, 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 in the space as well. I think it's going to disrupt a lot of a lot of things because there are there are when you look across the African continent, there are um, innovators, there are um, even smallholder farmers, there are many micro businesses that are generating value. The, the, these people are not getting value, the value that they, or the, the, the worth of the value that they are generating because of, of, of such issues. If I can be in Ghana and buy something from an e-commerce site in Botswana and get it delivered to my doorstep, I think that would be a game changer. So it's definitely a, a step in the right direction. That is very important. You know, at this moment, you can't buy my book in Africa. You can only buy it on Amazon India. And so this is the typical problem that you are mentioning. Exactly. Uh, the other point that you mentioned about the logistics of having to go out of Africa before returning to a different region of Africa with your produce is critical. Uh, you know, the same problem we found when we were trying to send vaccines to Africa. There were not enough cold stores and logistics centers where you could store these for distribution. So same goes for agriculture. So what you need at least are five regional hubs, which are well connected across the continent by air. So there, if you have cold storage hubs where the produce can be stored, and then you link these hubs with dedicated cargo flights, like you did for the flowers in Amsterdam or the vegetables to Dubai. I mean. African airlines have done this in the past because the direction of African exports was different. But when direction of African exports changes, I'm sure African airlines can service hubs in each region. And if you have these hubs in each region or more than one hub, you will be able to overcome this in some way without having to go to Dubai or Amsterdam to transship your goods. Yeah. Maureen, may I come back to you to see your experience, what do you think about how we can use technology better to improve the logistics of uh, intra-African trade in agriculture? I think it's very interesting that Desmond mentions uh, that they had to transport uh, pineapples from Ghana through Dubai, uh, which is um, 
a bit strange and also a bit tedious uh, for yeah, the market for the market as well. Um, but this is true because we do not have connectivity. There is lack of connectivity across African countries. And that's, uh, I think, entrepreneurs are creating solutions for their individual countries. We will find that there's small cold chain values, uh, value chains in Kenya or in Uganda or in Tanzania. But then this does not translate to them being able to have even the facility uh, to be able to connect that from say, for example, Kenya to South Sudan or something like that. And so uh, this also goes with, uh, I think, the reliance of the traditional logistic systems where we, I was speaking to a truck driver, I think, yesterday, and uh, he was telling me how he would transport uh, oranges from, uh, from Tanzania uh, through Marindi. So th they have to cross the port and they have to go through uh, the traditional ways of transporting as well. Yes, we have local or we have local airlines that could be able to trans transport that faster. And considering that he's going to uh, far areas, not just the port or near the, the coastline, then it becomes really difficult to transport this and uh, uh, I think maintain their freshness. But then we also have to think about the challenges that we have. So uh, say if we want to invest in cold chain, just uh, we're not, leveraging the, 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 the natural resources or the renewable energy resor uh, resources that we could be able to leverage in Africa. This is uh, because we do not have the knowledge. One, there's lack of knowledge and information about uh, all the technologies that we could be able to uh, leverage, uh, especially solar powered cold chain. Uh, and I think we have a company that we were looking at uh, recently uh, in Kenya doing solar powered uh, cold chain facility. And this uh, it would be a solution for, for, for many areas because if you think about the rural, rural Kenya, say Northern Kenya, they do not have uh, access to electricity. And so they have to use diesel powered uh, cold chain facilities, which are more expensive, maybe double uh, 200 times the, 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 the price of uh, solar powered uh, technology. So there's lack of connectivity as well as uh, lack of infrastructure and lack of uh, information for African farmers and uh, for people who are in the ecosystem. Very interesting solution. Again, I love this cross-cutting solution. So you try to solve trade logistics and bring in renewable energy, which also is uh, one of the SDGs that we are to achieve. So perfect combination. And I'm sure we can do this, this leads to job creation, intra-African trade. So I think there is much hope in this. Now, let me see some of the question. Uh, there is this question, which says the main challenges we face in Africa, especially Zambia, is agricultural machinery, access to agricultural finance and education on farming. If these can be prioritized, poverty levels and unemployment would reduce. Yes, I agree with you. Indeed, it would reduce. And I can say, since I was the Director General for Africa before I superannuated, we tried very hard to introduce these kind of institutions in Africa with training programs, which would do this. And I mentioned Malawi. So Malawi is actually not far from Zimbabwe, but there we are setting a Pan-African Institute, which will deal with some of these things in association with a private company now, a private Indian company who's interested in this. But the question of agricultural finance still remains. Now, how do we do that? Either we go to regional banks or we go to government funding or what Sankalp Africa Forum does summit is to have impact investors come into Africa. So these are the three uh, major areas, but I would like uh, Maureen also to answer this, but let me take one more question. Tanzania has very big arable unused land. The real need is investment. However, we are producing a lot, but have a big problem on inputs market and low production technology, including the absence of digital agriculture. How can some panelists help us on this? Depends entirely on funding and private sector. Farmers here do not benefit from their production. I think the major problem, Maureen, is production and post-harvest technology. So Maureen, would you like to take this, please, and give some suggestions? To our yes, I'll, 
I'd like to first acknowledge that there have been a, 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 an improvement because I think before COVID, we were only getting about 425 million USD invested into East Africa, especially for agriculture. And this has moved closely to 2 billion uh, being invested in East Africa. So there's of course investment that is coming on board and even through our forums, uh, I think SANCAP uh, just recently through IFC, we were able to invest into some ag tech uh, entrepreneurs uh, across Africa, some in Nigeria, Ethiopia, Kenya as well and other countries. So there is uh, improvements and there's uh, things that are happening uh, and uh, I, I guess the lack of knowledge of this investment uh, infrastructure is also something, but then uh, I think the lack of formalization of agriculture in itself is also a big problem because of the fact that we come from a base of uh, smallholder farmers who are, who are used to subsistence farming and not many large farmers are, are out here in East Africa. This is because of, yes, uh, Daniel, you, you mentioned that uh, Tanzania has arable land, but unused land. So we're not utilizing the resources that we have and also not utilizing technology or machinery that we could get uh, and is out there. So there's of course challenges and improvements that are going hand in hand, but then I, I think it's just being able to educate ourselves and involve ourselves in these conversations. And I did see, I think in the comment, uh, also uh, being able to work with policymakers to make machinery easier to import into Africa, uh, make um, technology easier to adapt into Africa, because uh, I think the adaptation and the use of machinery is something that is also a bigger problem. And then also being able to learn from uh, successful models that have worked out there so that we can be able to implement this into East Africa, because this then will enable us to grow our our markets and, and our value chains through the technology because technology is going to be a bigger part of this, especially with the climate change and things that are happening that are causing us to not be able, I think uh, it's estimated that yields will, will drop uh, about 15 to 30% uh, in the next couple of years. And this means 30 million tons of uh, food production will be, will be lost or we will, we will not have that. So we we'll still have to depend on uh, imports uh, and so we need to be able to think about what other apart from the traditional way of farming and apart from a traditional agricultural uh, system then creating uh, disruptive agricultural technologies that could be able to 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 help uh, grow crops in East Africa thank you I think you were given some very useful ideas uh, the next question is we find it is very difficult for farmers to adopt digital technologies. We need policy makers to help farmers to change their mindsets. Daniel, since you are in the field, what is your view of this? Is it difficult for farmers to adopt digital technology and do they, do they need policy assistance? Thank you very much. Yeah, I am, no, um, it is not difficult. It, it is not difficult, much as they, 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 they are well trained on it, 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 is, it is not difficult. And I think this is what we are also missing in Tanzania. We have very few um, fintech uh, companies which are dealing with uh, uh, agricultural technology. And we are very new uh, uh, on that. And we really need uh, to, to, we really need to invest on this now because we tried with some of the farmers, I think those farmers in Kigoma, which is very far from Dar es Salaam, uh, over a thousand kilometers from Dar es Salaam, but they were able to, to, to take up. Uh, there are two ways. One, we, we use the, the normal Androids, and then we, we use also the USSDs, which, which is very fine. So it's not really difficult. Thank you. Now, on this, I would like to tell you something, how you can work with India. India has a very big program called the India Technical and Economic Cooperation Program. You can see it on the net. It brings people from Africa and other developing countries for training programs in India, which are entirely funded by India. <clears throat> you can be nominated by your government or by the embassy. Thanks to COVID, these programs could not be held in India, but we started an e-ITEC. 
Now, e-iTech has been developed into something called on-site iTech. And this is on the ITEC.in website, on-site iTech. What this means is that if you have a requirement, let us say of a group of farmers who need familiarity with FinTech or digital technologies, you can make a request to the Indian embassy and they will work towards doing this program with you remotely from India and you will be in your country, whether you are Ghana or Tanzania or whichever country you are in one place. All that a place needs is connectivity. Now, frankly, in Ghana, there is a very large uh, KAIT, Coffee Annan ICT Center supported by India. And in Tanzania, similarly, there's a very big IT center supported by India in which you could always find these kind of auditoriums or classrooms where you could do this program. This program does not cost you anything, but you need to organize it. So at least 30, 40, 50, 100 people are there and you give your requirement and a program will be created for you. You can do this through the local Indian High Commission by making an organized program. Now, whether you take the lead, Sankal takes the lead, whoever, but somebody needs to make the proposal and it will be done. So this gap can be covered. That I can assure you. The next question was, access to a timely agricultural information is critical to improve productivity. Digitized act techs can play a big role. Our organization, Farm Radio International, is active in this regard. FRI shares resources with 1,300 plus stations in 41 countries and work with more than 100 of them on projects in 11 countries. This sounds impressive. So Maureen, how can we work with Farm Radio International? Maureen? Sorry, I think I lost you for a minute there. Okay, whatever this question that I read out about Farm Radio International, how do you think IntelliCap or Sankalp could relate with them and you know give information useful to agriculture through their facilities? I think uh, using our Sankalp uh, arm, we are doing a lot of uh, convening and uh, being able to provide this information, especially exam and a good example is this session that we're having uh, at the moment. But then also in our, in our um, annual forums, uh, global forums and African forums where we, we do have sessions uh, focused on agri-tech. So uh, I think we can be able to see how we can co-design uh, programs to be able to provide this information on a regular basis. But I did want to uh, second something that Daniel had mentioned. Yes, it's true that in Tanzania, people are, uh, there are no adopters of uh, agricultural solutions are not there. And we see that about over 60% of funding that comes into East Africa comes into, into Kenya. And so I think it's an urge for anyone who uh, is doing impact investing and as well, I think from our IntelliCup side to be able to create solutions for other African countries uh, uh, of which we are doing, but then I think uh, maybe a bit more forecast into, into, into information sharing and as well as connecting and uh, creating capital for them and capital facilitation. Thank you. Uh, subsistence farming is unsustainable. So organizing farmers in groups, offering information about weather, training farmers about improved climate smart seed varieties, and making them available is a game changer to production. Maureen, I think this is what you are doing. Yes, it is what we're doing. Uh, and uh, we've been very lucky to build ecosystems and also enable these ecosystems through uh, connectivity and uh, just being able to put people in touch, especially enterprises, put them in touch with investors as well as uh, uh, create knowledge sessions for them. In our past. So how can people who are asking this question relate to IntelliCap or work through Sankal? How do they engage with that? 
So through our forums, so we, you can follow us on social media, especially uh, so that you can be able to uh, get all our updates. Uh, as well as our reports on our website, uh, which we have created through programs that we have run and uh, market assessment uh, projects that we have done. And so uh, being able to follow us uh, to get this information, is, we have a SUNCAP uh, activity happening in Ghana, uh, I think in about four days. Uh, and then we also have a global summit coming up uh, in September and uh, an African summit coming up in March. So just being able to attend those sessions and uh, keeping yourself updated with the information that is on social media platforms. Thank you. You know, this question makes me a bit sad. After the second India-Africa summit, India offered 10 rural technology centers and 10 farm science centers two for every region of Africa. And as my book shows, no African country showed interest in any of those centers. They only wanted vocational training centers and IT centers. Nobody took up the offers of rural technology centers and farm science centers, exactly what the questioner is today asking. Otherwise, we would have had these centers in African countries where precisely this is what we were trying to do. So that was a missed opportunity. Now I noticed that there is Mr. Adam Lyle here from Padang in Singapore. I don't know, I always thought Padang is in Indonesia, but Padang in Singapore. Mr. Lyle, would you like to say something to contribute to this discussion? Oh, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I, I just had stepped away for a moment. Um, is there a specific uh, point that you'd uh, like to put to me? Yes, I would like to ask you, for instance, you are in Singapore, how can you help in getting more agri-tech into African agriculture? Or can you channel more investment into their uh, agriculture? These are the kind of questions which have come up today. What sure. part do you think you can work with them on? Sure. Uh, well, um, th thank you for um, offering me a chance to speak. Uh, well, I, I guess, f firstly, I, I just happened to, uh, to happen upon this opportunity only yesterday. So um, I jumped on and registered. Uh, certainly, where I uh, see, I mean, I, I'm kind of old fashioned in the approach that, first of all, people here have to be aware of uh, the opportunity, both in terms of, you know, where there are problems, there are opportunities. I think it's about um, people being uh, more aware here in Singapore on uh, the African continent, what, what is happening, where, where the, the real needs are. There's a, a you may be aware, but, but there's been in the, the last uh, five years, I will say a very big increase in interest in investment in agri-food. Um, and a lot of that began with agri-tech in the region, you know, Southeast Asia, as uh, you'd be aware, it's a very large community of around 650 million people. And it is made up uh, of around about 100 million smallholder farmers. So there's a lot of work and uh, tech investment has gone into supporting uh, smallholder farmers in the region. My interest, and I work with uh, various groups uh, here, one of which is uh, Grow Asia, uh, which um, you know, has affiliations uh, in Africa as well. Uh, and, and we run a whole range of programs supporting smallholder farmers from things like um, hackathons to scouting programs to challenges. And we bring in large corporates to support those to encourage different levels of innovation. So my interest in uh, joining today is uh, to learn uh, of the opportunities and then I suppose part of my contribution is trying to see how I can ch uh, channel our ecosystem, our community to be more aware of uh, how the opportunities, how they might be involved. Um, I'm very uh, reticent about sending, you know, Singapore, you know, tech to other markets uh, without them first understanding those markets in a, in a real and meaningful way. But I think uh, that's the tech side. The capital side, however, 
is uh, there has been the creation of a lot of uh, investment funds here. A lot of that money in the last uh, 24 months has gone into kind of the hot areas, alternative protein, which is, I would believe, a less relevant thing to be focusing on um, in Africa at the moment. However, while, of course, the, the markets are all of a sudden in retreat a bit at the moment, there are large uh, funds here that are looking for opportunities. And so I think it's one of those things you have to start to educate both the investment market and the tech market uh, here in Singapore about the opportunities and how to work with groups like Intelcap and, you know, who have the conduits and the access um, to markets. So I'm sorry, that's a little bit general in my answer, but <laughs> I wasn't totally prepared uh to jump in, but uh, I would say, and I was just looking at Mr. the number of people. You have obviously never been a Boy Scout whose motto used to be, be prepared. So sorry for catching you off guard, but I think what you have said is very useful. So I think there are three important leaps. One, for Sankalp to involve you with the Sankalp Africa Summit next year. The second <laughs> is for the people who are on the uh, audience today, you can link with Mr. Lyle to take him up on his promise of guiding you <laughs> on how you become worthy of investment. And thirdly, I think you mentioned Grow Asia. Yes. Now, Grow Asia, <coughs> excuse me, could be a useful thing on which uh, there could be more interaction. Thank you uh, so much. <clears throat> I think we also now have with us Mr. Ayodeji. Balogun, who leads Afex Nigeria. Sir, if you are here, would you like to respond to some of the discussion today from your point of view? Thank you very much. Um, I, am, I am indeed here and it's been a great conversation. Um, so, I mean, for me, I think uh, just being uh, um, operational in Africa, having to set up businesses across five, six African countries, um, across East and West Africa, and uh, also living both the, both the digital side of agriculture, um, but also the physical side of it, right from production to marketing, to setting up a financial, a capital markets vehicle, a marketplace for commodities. Um, you know, one of the first things I always say when we come to ag tech conversations is that, um, you know, we cannot, we shouldn't limit ag tech to software development. It goes way beyond software. You know, you have to come in from seed science. Um, you have to come in from tissue culture, genetic, you know, genetic engineering, hybridization, all the way to um, you know, crop management practices, best agronomy practices, regenerative, regenerative agriculture, you know, and then go into farm management systems and the broader software side. So first is that broad-based view, um, you know, you know, view of ag tech, you know, both the hardware as well as the software and the interplay between that with the physical nature, which agriculture really presents. That's my first trust. The second part is that Africa is an infrastructure deficient, deficient continent. Um, so, you know, imagine Amazon in the United States, you know, where there were no delivery addresses. Um, how would Amazon have built out, you know, its technology delivery system? You know, an average community in Africa has no street address. Um, you describe by the name of the community and the house of the village head and how far your house is from that. So um there is no ag tech without a physical component and i've seen a lot of startup uh bond cash in a free of a pure play tech play in agriculture uh without investing in the physical infrastructure that complements that um the way i like to think about this is think about the evolution of alibaba in, in, in across Asia versus Amazon in US. And you'll see, you know, what I like to call the digital experience, you know, you know, augmenting technology, a digital world with a physical, uh, um, with a physical operations that can help with execution. That's the second part. Uh, I think the third part that I like to also push in, in the ag tech conversation is that 
you know, from our experience, you know, it's that for agriculture to work, you need to fix across multiple sectors. So you need to have the technology domain, you know, technology innovation that technology brings. Second is you need to have the domain experts in agriculture itself. And most often than not, you need the financial expertise. Uh, so our view is that you need to have that co-creation and interplay between technology, agriculture, and finance. And that sort of themed what we as FX has sort of pushed for the last five years, we call it code cash crop. And it's an event that brings in players from across these three sectors, agriculture, finance, and technology, and allows the co-creation of new solutions. Because we think when these three things can come together, you have true meaningful and impactful innovation um, as Actel, Actec solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that is most interesting. You gave us three important points. But you know, there was a separate question raised today about farmer producer organizations in India. I want to ask you, in Nigeria, how are farmers organized? Do you have any farmer organizations? Yes, we do have some very, very large uh, farmer organizations in Nigeria. So for instance, we have the Rice Farmers Association that has over a million members and they are able to sort of drive and unlock finance. We have the All Farmers Association of Nigeria, which is also a very strong, more inclined towards political lobbying. Uh, there's a Maze Association of Nigeria. Uh, we do have, um, so sometimes it's tied along crop value chains. And sometimes you do have them across uh, geographic spreads. Uh, but I think we that there's stronger, you know, the ones along the crop value chains are a bit more stronger and more prominent. Uh, most of them are probably most impactful around policy advocacy. Uh, some of them have been able to prove uh, stronger around fundraising and unlocking finance for their members. Uh, but then all of them still need stronger sort of corporate governance uh, 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 practices and just ability to have full time management and an effective, um, you know, almost a democratic leadership structure. I think those are some of the things that they need to develop on. But yes, we do have very large uh, farmer organizations. Very interesting. And, yeah, and following up on that so you know i also chair this surfing which is a small order finance and investment network um that across the world tries to drive um, aggressive <laughs> financing and um, at surfing one of the things we spent a large part of last year and this year on is how can we start to rethink how small you know farm organizations can raise funds is there a world where we then have uh funds that are managed at where the limited partners are these farm organizations and then a lot of bfis um, can come in as gps and they understanding their structure understanding the nuances of the play then effectively deliver financing to their members um, or invest in long-term infrastructure that then eases um, doing business for all the other members. So this is some of the things that, you know, as Safin, uh, we spend time on and will be something that, you know, we could also push uh, forward in conversations if there's interest. Would you be kind enough to send me on my email uh, some information on this last thing, how you, the small farmers raise finance? I'll, I'll love to. So if I would be very happy to be make a connection about it. Right. Okay. Now I think I want to move to Mr. Abdiwak Bekele from Omish, Omish to Joy. Mr. Bekele, you have the floor. Are you from Ethiopia, sir? Mr. Bekele? No, I don't hear him. So I'm going to move ahead. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, oh, Mr. How, Bekele, you are how there. How are you, everyone? Uh, is it audible? Hello, hello. Is, yes, is it audible? Yes, you're audible. Hello? Yes, Ato Bekele, please go ahead. Is it audible now? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Abdurakala. Uh, I am Fur and CTO of Omish to Joy. Yes, please go ahead. I think we can't hear you. Yes. Maybe try putting your video off and reaching out to us. Okay, I don't think we can hear him. Uh, Maureen, may I come back to you about the farmer FPO? Somebody asked a question on FPOs in India. Would you like to speak about any experience with FTOs in Africa that you have? Hello. Yes, Maureen, you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So tell us about anything about FPOs in Africa. Any African examples of FPOs? Yes, we do, have, uh, we do have we do have farmer, we do have FPOs in Africa. And um, I think uh, these are mainly focused on like uh, cash crops uh, that we export. And uh, of course, this brings a challenge of for production in uh, for food production in Africa for Africans. Uh, so FPOs uh, are there, uh, especially around coffee, sugar, um, as well as rice and things like that. Uh, but then I think they're faced with a lot of challenges. Uh, uh, I think one of the challenges that people did mention was about policy making and uh, just the policy that surrounds those. Um, and just being able to say access credit, uh, but then they are very helpful uh, for small uh, smallholder farmers uh, who are able to to access credit through them, but also have market linkages. So these have been uh, organizations that have been there for for years and have been able to help people in that uh, sense. But then I think people are moving more into commercializing the uh, the, the production and going into individualizing that. Uh, and of course, this affects, uh, I think someone in the comments did mention that uh, access to credit and especially with uh, land rights and having investments in those areas becomes really difficult when you're not belonging to a farm up, uh, to an FPO. Uh, and so I think uh, there's need for eruption of those, especially in other areas, not only focusing on the cash crops, uh, the coffee and uh, the rest, but then I think the challenges that have been there, it's about price hedging and uh, things like that that have really affected the farmers and have really uh, kind of reduced the, the, the incomes that they get from this uh, farmer at the FPOs and that's they're they moving away from them a little bit. But then um, access to credit becomes really difficult in those areas because uh, I think in Africa, when investment comes, it, it, it becomes really difficult for people to access those uh, due to the land rights and all. Uh, other challenges that we are facing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maureen. Uh, well, I must thank Sankal for hosting this session and a lot of gratitude to uh, Mr. Desmond Pony from Complete Pharma in Ghana and Ms. Maureen Mutike from Intelica for your very valuable input and I'm sure all the participants today, from what I could sense from the vibrant chat, that this was a most useful session. Now, I apologize in advance because I could not take all the questions. Uh, there, are, there were many questions, but I think uh, this can go ahead. But I think a lot of uh, contacts have been exchanged, ideas have been exchanged, the direction is clear. So I recommend to Sankal that I'm sure at the next Africa Summit, they would have a session 
to follow up this one. And perhaps following that, there should be another conversation like this to see one year from now, what distance we have traversed on these issues relating to agriculture in Africa, because this is core to solving many of Africa's problems. I'm going to end here with a sincere thank you to all of you. And I hand back to Mr. George Murage. Thank you very much, Ambassador, uh, for, for uh, coordinating the session and curating the session. Uh, I'd also like to uh, you know, thank you all for joining us uh, for the one hour, seven minutes. Uh, we are sorry we went over time, but I think the discussion was very interesting. We will be hosting a small event in Accra, Ghana, right before the Andy West Africa conference. And I have put in my email ID in the chat box in case you'd like to get involved, in case you're in Ghana and you'd like to get involved, please write to me and we will definitely find a way to do something together. The Sankalp Global Summit is also coming up on the 27th to 29th of September. In case you're interested in putting in a session, please write to me. I will direct you to the right place to get the resources and you will put, I mean, you, you can put in a session and we can definitely uh, have this, have more of these types of discussions. The Africa Summit is coming up in March, 2023. You're all invited to actually participate, submit sessions. Yeah, and let's get together and discuss agriculture and the potential it has in Africa. Thank you so much and have a very good rest of the day.